Today we're going to look at the Class 47 and one of the maintenance tasks which I'm pretty sure you're going to find really interesting. Welcome to In The Loop. Well, hello there, folks, and welcome to the Watercrest Line. Now, before we see what's been going on with James Knight All GC, of course, it's time for a quickfire look around the railway to see what's been happening since the last episode. Well, starting with the big news, if we look at our standard four tender 75079, the tender tank has now been mounted onto the chassis. This is a really big achievement for the guys because pretty much everything you see here is brand new bar the axe boxes, which interestingly came from a class 40. Not many standard four tenders actually survived the scrapyard, not because they were cut up, but they were actually brought up by steel mills. The tender tanks were cut off and the chassis, because of their rigid construction, were actually used for carrying steel ingots. This is why they had to essentially build a brand new one. The next stage will be plumbing it all together, handbrake mechanism, of course a lick of paint, but it's coming along incredibly well and a huge achievement to the guys here at Rockley. Now looking at our little tank engine, on the boiler side the fittings have been overhauled and on the mechanical side it's been fitted with a mechanical lubricator. Now initially this engine was, um, had what's called a hydrostatic lubricator, essentially it uses steam and sprays the steam oil in the cylinders as a fine mist. That's fantastic when it's in steam and on the run. However, this engine, because it goes away to other railways, gets shunted about, if it's not in steam, it doesn't get that lubrication, which is why the mechanical and more modern invention has been fitted. You won't actually see this in service because it'll be under one of its engine splashes, which are the little blue kind of half moons you see on the side. Now, looking at the side tanks where the water is stored, they've been doing some patchwork repairs on the bottom where most corrosion is found, and they've been doing some cleaning up, painting, and adding an extra little bonus feature, a tool tunnel. This is where all the rakes and fire irons are stored. Normally, they'll be kept on the back of a cab, generally in the way, but now they're actually gonna be stored neat and tidy and out of the way, making it even more user-friendly for the crews. Looking at our Ivert tank, it's currently stopped for an annual exam, and they're also taking the opportunity, a bit like the 7F, to do some work. So on this engine, they're doing some work on the ash pan, which is that hopper underneath the firebox, which catches all that spent ash. And they're also doing the work on the petticoat. Now the petticoat essentially acts a bit like a funnel. It helps draw that hot air through the firebox, increasing the drafting as it goes through the boiler, and generally increasing the rate of heat transfer. Over here in the carriage works, they're continuing the kind of spruce up and varnish of the interior of the Gooder car. Exterior, you notice the wheels are missing, and that's because they're currently away being machined. While the griddle's in, they're also doing work on the roof. They've stripped down that outer coating and repainted it. The idea is the whole of this vehicle can go out for another, say, three to five years, and then come back in for a full, gutting, complete overhaul. The coach in at the moment is currently having its vacuum cylinder worked on. And essentially this is normally a two day process. You have to take out the back cylinders, work on them and then get them back in. And that's quite a, a long laborious task. Now the guys with their new clean room, still under construction albeit, the aim will be to have a set of back cylinders always ready to go. So a coach can come in, old ones come off, new ones go on, coach goes straight back out again. This takes a laborious two-day job down to just half a day, and this allows them to keep on top of their rolling maintenance of the fleet and, well, keep the fleet rolling. Now, a few of you guys have asked for an update on Lionel Class 50. Well, the generator has been away at the works, and the fault essentially has been nailed down to what can only be described as 35 years of grime that accumulates on diesel engines um, just naturally as they're ticking over. In fact, in 1982, it got so bad that um, the Class 50s had a scavenger van put in, and the idea was that was to suck out all the oil residue in the air and soot out the top. Back in BR days, it was far more practical to regularly change generators, which is a luxury we just don't have nowadays. Now, on the plus side, while they are doing work on the main generator, they're also taking the opportunity to do some remedial works on the inside of the, what is now a very spacious engine room. As always, if you do want to keep track with everything that's happening with this locomotive, and do not forget to follow the Lion Group on Facebook, where they post regular updates and also give you links to their fundraising to help pay for this work. 
Now we haven't looked at a miniature railway for a while, so we'll do that right now. Over the winter, they've been doing their winter maintenance program, which is all complete now. They've installed two new sets of points, realigned the track going into the platform. The section on the left is short term a siding, but in long term is going to be a run round loop. And the section on the right, short term is going to be a bay platform. And long term, eventually, it'll be a turntable with stabling siding. So plenty to look forward to. Now, while they haven't been running trains, their locomotives have been away on holiday. Patricia has been down at the Hastings Railway, and Jerry Lee has been at the Eastley Lakeside Railway for their diesel gala. So, even though they weren't running on our line, they were still getting a fair bit of mileage in. Well, Driver for a Tenor was a roaring success with Kilmerston, so it was time for Phoenix to take the reins. And once again, it was incredibly well received. As a little bonus, they even have a steam frame out in steam, so people can have a good close-up look to something you don't normally get to see. Now, while Phoenix was doing that down at Alsford, up here at Ropley, the P-Way guys had taken possession of the line to do some work on the track alignment, so making sure you get a smoother ride when going around the curves. This has the added bonus of preserving the life of the point work, the track in general, and of course the rolling stock, so it doesn't get bashed and rocked around as much. So, essentially, it's a win all round. Of course they were, However, as soon as I turned up, they just finished their last job and had gone to lunch. Turns out I have spectacular timing. Well, as always, a lot happening down here at the Wardcrest line. Now for today's topic, as I mentioned, we're at James Nightall GC and the maintenance task I was alluding to is brakes. We always talk about how it's important to try and get engines running, but it's equally as important to be able to stop them again when required. Now, this is actually quite an interesting and sciencey topic. So we took the opportunity to chat to our operations manager, Richard, and tell us a little bit more. So Richard, brake blocks on the 47. Um, first of all, what are they actually made of? Um, the brake blocks are mainly made up of cast iron. Um, basically, they, they would need to be a softer material than the loco tire. Loco tire on this is, is you've got a wheel pan, which is the main, the main disc. And then there's a loco tire, which is a steel tire that's, that's basically uh, shrunk onto the wheel set and so the, the consumable item if you like is the cast iron brake block there's also uh, an amount of phosphorus that's that's in the in the block and that was primarily used to actually initially that when BR started doing it was to reduce loco fires because the loco has, has got oil it's got grease it's got fuel you do get sparks particularly the 47s were quite notorious for sparks in fact there are spark guards up here on these pipe work um, they added phosphorus basically to reduce the amount of sparking. They'd end up like Catherine wheels from braking at high speed. Yeah, less than ideal. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly that. Um, they also found that by adding phosphorus, it actually reduced the wear rate. So it meant that they were blocking less regularly. So, so in some ways, you know, actually they, they solved one problem and actually solved, solved several in the same, same process. Saved themselves a lot of money um, and reduced, because it's a pretty unpleasant job re-blocking a loco like this. You're underneath, um, very little room with the traction motor behind the wheel set. A lot of this stuff is covered in brake dust, as naturally that's, that's where it's come from. Um, and everything you take down is heavy, but what you're putting back in is a damn sight heavier. You know, so it's, uh, when you think the work is done, it's only just started. You've only just un uncovered half of it, so absolutely. The brake blocks themselves, how are they actually held in place? Um, on the back of the block, this is the top, this is basically the inside of the block. There's a, there's a little uh, a sort of a, a saddle on the back there, and there's a, there's a steel pin that goes down through this hanger. And, and actually secures it. The problem is it takes two of you to do it because you're trying to hold the weight of the block. Um, the, the, the weight of the block is quite considerable. You're in a pit, so you're holding it at head height. Um, it's always good to have other people helping you, but there's not a lot of room for two people to be in the right place at the right time. So uh, yes, it's, there's not normally a queue forming to do this job. Normally there's a, you look around and there's nobody stood behind you when they're when the, you when see the, the job. You tumbleweed flying across exactly. the Exactly, yeah, <laughs> somehow it's become my role in, in life doing the diesels, but uh, it's not one I relish, I must admit. I would ask, how long do brake blocks last? But I suppose now it's in the heritage industry, it's very much not regular work, so. Yeah, I mean, this loco was designed to run at a sort of 95 mile an hour, um, and we'd be doing a lot, of, a lot of high speed running for distance and not much braking, but braking from high speed. We're obviously 25 mile an hour, but being on a railway that's uphill or downhill, 50% of the time we're braking. The, the blocks on this have actually lasted for probably three or four years in truth. So with, with sort of careful braking, um, it's not too bad, but it's, it, as I say, it does very much depend on speed, how many miles the loco runs 
and, and uh, you know, the weight of the train that you're pulling. Is there much of a bedding in process once you put the brakes in or can we just go for it straight You've got off? to be careful, yeah, particularly if you've re-blocked the whole loco. Um, these are set to a certain profile on the inside of the block, but obviously it takes a little bit of while to actually wear in and bed into the, to the wheel set. So your brake force, if you like, is, uh, is somewhat reduced having, having, until everything beds in and, uh, and polishes up to the profile of the wheel. So when you can see on the side of the block there, there's actually a thumbprint um, on the bottom of the block there. That's actually the wear point. So you, you basically, you, on, your, on your maintenance cycles, as we look around the loco, checking springs and all the other bits and pieces, we'll be looking out for making sure that that thumbprint's not getting too close. One, one of the blocks that we've taken off, um, you can see there that we've actually just about got down to the, to the wear point on the block and as you can see that's considerably, considerably smaller than the one that's come off Not of much it. left on that side so as soon as it gets to thumb thinned it's it's, gone it's game out. over yeah the, the block itself has got a steel plate inside it just actually attached to the band and the idea is if the block cracks the steel plate actually keeps it in the shape so if you break one it'll stay put as a block and so it doesn't shatter job. fall apart and then and knack come you off otherwise. and fly up on a platform or, or something like that so just following on from the brake um, blocking, once all the blocks are set up, we then have to set the, set the blocks up so they're actually ready to, to, to operate. These locos are fitted with an automatic uh, slack adjuster. So on the, on the steam locos, you've got a, a turnbuckle with lock nuts that you have to follow up every four or five days on the southern engines. The guys have to go in the pit with a big spanner and take the, take the, the wear up as the blocks wear. Um, these have got uh, an automatic slack adjuster. So there's a, a big nut with a screw thread on the end here that, that basically ratchets itself up and follows the block to the wheel. And there's an air pipe that runs down from the brake cylinder. And effectively, every time the brake cylinder travels past a certain distance, it'll blow air to the slack adjuster and tell it to take the distance up. So it actually tells from the, you know, by uncovering a port on the, on the brake cylinder that it needs to supply some air to the slack adjuster and follow the blocks up. So in theory, it, it, it maintains itself. That's, that's incredible actually. Is there any danger of it uh, kind of adjusting itself too much and going too you, lock, you, you, locked Yes, on? you have to keep an eye on it to make sure they don't, if the, if the ratchet stops working properly, you can find that it'll start winding itself on all the way. That's, that's one issue with them. If in some ways, perhaps they're a bit clever for their own good. Um, but if, if they maintain well and, and, and you keep an eye on them, it saves an awful lot of work in the pit. It, it, basically, this bogey's got one on each corner. Um, it's a six-wheel six, uh, six bogey. Um, so that it's this one here will manage this wheel set both sides and the middle axle on this side. And the corresponding one at the other end will do the other, the other three blocks per corner. So, yeah, quite a clever... Quite a clever thing. The early locos, the, the early class 20 we've got, has got a manual um, adjuster, literally a, a quarter of a spanner on there and a, an adjuster, whereas the later one, by the time those had come into service, they had the automatic type. So. Fascinating bit scared. Yeah, I've never considered that you actually need to, well, carry on adjusting for the brakes, but actually when you think it's, it's very all, logical. All the time you're using work. The, yeah, the block's getting smaller. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Richard, brilliant. Thank you so much for this. It's been really exciteful. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Thanks, Will. Well, there you have it. A lot of science and some interesting technology involved. That's it from us this week. So, guys, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. Thanks once again to Richard for chatting to us, and we'll see you next time.